we're working with. So let's talk about cryptocurrency fraud. It's exciting. So I have actually worked with um, forensic engagements and forensic audits with as a CFO. So that's how I kind of got into the certified and financial forensic certification through the AICPA. And I served as an expert witness in several revenue audit frauds, right? So I was a CFO for a company that had 350 plus franchisees and then the franchisees, we would do revenue audits and then it was, um, you know, if they under reported their revenues, then we didn't get the royalties. And so then it was my job to testify in arbitration or in any court, any court cases to show that. So evidence is critical. And as we've gotten more advanced in fraud, so has the technologies and so have ways in which it can be hidden. So that is what we're going to talk about today. So first, I'm going to start with the costs of like cyber, of like cryptocurrency frauds, and then some of the recent um, cryptocurrency frauds, I just picked a few of them to show you the extensive nature in which these frauds can occur and how voluminous they are. And then we're gonna actually define cryptocurrency and then tell you the types of fraud. So that way you have enough information to kind of understand what these are. I do quite a bit of continuing professional education on cryptocurrencies and on forensic accounting and fraud. And I think in my opinion, those are my most favorite. So I love those, but um, but if you know, that's just basically where I like to have uh, all of these items come through. So let's get started. Let's talk about the costs of cryptocurrency fraud. So there is a bit of a high cost, right? So in 2019, the cost of crimes involving Bitcoin and any type of like cryptocurrency was 4.3 million dollars. So just think about that. 4.3 million dollars in 2019 and that was according to chain analysis and the wall street journal then that figure was bigger than in 2017 and 2018 that had a combined of just 3 billion so in one year alone so it is becoming a big issue as we can tell and it's also costing you know organizations money people money so it's a it's becoming more and more pressing for us as uh, accountants and forensic accountants to kind of work with that. So let's talk about some recent uh, cryptocurrency frauds. So this was the latest one that I have found and I thought I would share it. And so the, there, you have access to these this presentation and you can click on where the source comes from. But this was really interesting because it involved Brazil and one wouldn't think, you know, that we as the Department of Justice would be involved in that. But what the Department of Justice did is they seized the cryptocurrencies, which was worth about $24 million. And they received that request from the Brazilian government because basically what was happening in Brazil was part of a bigger investigation. And it was more about $200 million in cryptocurrencies scams and then it that it was like huge it defrauded you know tens of thousands of brazilians and so that was of concern for the u.s and then actually this gentleman actually came to the u.s and that's how the u.s got involved so this was the most recent um one that i have found that i thought i would share so just this month alone look at that 20 days in and look what we have you know so it's a, it's it's a crazy world but now we have another one that I found to be the uh, interesting and the one that I wanted to share was basically that um, is not even, oh, and I'll get to your questions. So as I go through this, I will, I thank you definitely put in your Q and A, any questions you have. And maybe when I'm done with this, cause this is like a short presentation, um, I will get to them, but we do have a question that I thought cryptocurrency is not even legal. How come there are many millions of frauds? Well, the cryptocurrency is legal. Bitcoin is legal. And we'll talk about that later on in the, in the presentation, but it, there is, it's legal. It's just not backed by a government entity or by a bank. But yeah, there, it's also it's supposed to be very secure when you use it with blockchain technology, but there is still fraud involved. So definitely that is something that we need to consider. So in this, um, let me go back. 
So in this fraud here that three men were charged by a U.S. prosecutor with helping run a 722, let that sink in, right, million dollar fraud that was also known as a high-tech Ponzi scheme. And we're going to define a Ponzi scheme. You probably know Bernie Madoff, and that was probably the most recent Ponzi scheme that most of us are familiar with, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And we like to call cryptocurrencies like high-tech tech Ponzi schemes. And what these men did is they operated a company known as Bit Club Network. And what Bit Club Network did is it took money from investors in exchange for shares that they said were in cryptocurrencies, but they did a mining pool. And we'll talk about that. And then they rewarded the items of the investors from new investors. So think about the Bernie Madoff scandal, right? So Bernie Madoff took money from me, let's say, and put it into, uh, tried to get new investors and kind of transferred that money. And that's the whole purpose of a Ponzi scheme. And so this is what these gentlemen have done as well. And that's what makes it so crazy. And so then we have here that Bitcoin mining is exactly what they are doing and so and here you see also i tried to put the source i'm here so you can read up on it if you want to do more and uh, and we'll send these out as well afterwards about the sources and all of that but here you see that bitcoin mining is what they're doing like so what they're doing is a process that miners that what they do is they issue new bitcoins and they use like special software which usually has a ton of complex algorithms and then that's what bit club network did so they just claimed this pool of investment money and to buy like mining hardware and then the computer capacity and then they distributed the profits according to like what the government said so that is pretty much how they ended up doing that bit so these are two of the most common like you know two of the ones that i thought were staggering because one happened in this month and the other one was like happened and it's like 722 million dollars so i thought those were just some interesting snippets that i wanted to share with you so now, and let's see, I'm going to check again our Q&A to make sure that there's not any, any other questions in there. Let's take a look at that. Nope, we're good. All right. If you do have questions, do not hesitate to put them in the Q&A. I'd be happy to address them as soon as uh, we can. Perfect. So let's what is cryptocurrency right so i always like to have definitions and basically it's a virtual currency or a virtual token and not completely different from what you're used to in terms of like us dollars or euros or anything of that nature these are more electronic assets and what they use is encryption for security they live online and they are not backed by the government or any central banks so now the FASB codification is taking into consideration this ele electronic assets, right? Because now we have to think about cash. It's not no longer a tangible in this case, like a bill. It is a currency, but now since we have uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is the most common, then the FASB codification is kind of now addressing that as well. So that's our working definition for cryptocurrency here. And then we have, um, basically, it became like a cultural, I would say a cultural phenomenon in 2017, when the price of Bitcoin was like the most, one of the most established cryptocurrencies, and then it like skyrocketed to 20,000. So Bitcoin is probably the ones, you know, and you'll see a lot of the pictures that I included in this presentation are of Bitcoin, but now there's thousands of different cryptocurrencies. So from something that was nothing, you know, like just it was a, a physical dollar, let's say, to now an electronic asset where Bitcoin was one of the most popular and the one that skyrocketed and kind of put this on the map. Now we have a several more. Okay. And so then and I'm looking at the chat as well to see if there's more questions. And I'll get to those um, as, as we go along. So now let's talk about some terminology here, OK? And so this is where it, it's important. Like, there's so many different emerging technologies and so many things that we have to like kind of keep in contact, like keep abreast of, especially when we're talking about fraud or forensic examinations. So blockchain is basically a public ledger that every transaction is there from the inception of that cryptocurrency. And so blockchains are maintained in a decentralized manner, right? So that means that copies of the blockchain are maintained on many computers and globally rather than
then in a central computer controlled by like a third party financial institution like a bank. So the blockchain activity can be viewed on various publicly available block explorer websites and basically and such as blockchain info for Bitcoin. So I added that there for you as well. So you could see that. So that's it. And blockchain works very closely with Bitcoin because that's kind of what keeps the security available. But as we'll see as we go throughout the presentation, you'll, you'll see that it also could be a problem. So then we have public addresses, right? So this is where an individual stores their cryptocurrency in a public address, which is like just a string of alphanumeric characters. And the public address is like your account number that exists only as an entry on that blockchain. So you need blockchain as the technology of encryption, but then you need a public address. Think of it as your account number. But then you as an individual can have an infinite number of public addresses for each of your blockchains and your currencies. Then we have private keys. So now we start getting into, so we have public addresses, now we have private keys, and this is like the funds. So your currency in each public address, right, are now controlled through the use of now another string, and this is of alphanumeric characters called a private key. And this would be an example of your private key. And then this private key is like your password. And that required is for you to spend any of the funds in your public address. And so remember, your public address is like your account number. So you kind of need both the public address and you need the private keys to work with to actually access your cryptocurrencies, right? But anyone, here's the issue, anyone who possesses the correct private key can spend the funds in the associated public addresses. So now if your private key is lost or stolen, the funds are locked away permanently since no one has that private key needed to spend those funds. If the private key now is ever stolen by your hackers, then the funds can be taken by the hackers and you as the original owner have no recourse. So that's why cryptocurrencies are considered like risky. So if you do lose your private keys and you don't, you know, your, your account number is cool, but if you don't have this private key, you can't access any of your funds within your addresses. And if you do, if you lose it or somebody gets to it, they can keep the money and you have no recourse. This is not FDIC insured. The banks don't deal with that. So it's at your own peril, but it's technically, it's supposed to be pretty, uh, you know, safe if you have blockchain technology that can encrypt it, give you this public ledger. So things to consider. Then we have a wallet seed, and this is where you as an individual would have all of your private keys, right? And that would be, and they're generated in strings, and they're either 12, 15, 18, 21, or 24 randomly generated words, which is called a, a seed. So here's an example of one, crash, noise, pluck, unique, elbow, hero, income, coyote, emotion, you know, nothing that makes any sense whatsoever. And one seed can generate an endless supply of private keys key and public address pairs. So think of like your seed as your wallet, and then you can have these public addresses and your private keys linked. So that way you can access your funds depending on how many currencies and items you have. So that's a wallet seed. And then the types of cryptocurrency fraud. So before we get into that, the, um, the copy of the slides, I see that in the chat. If you go to my website, drvpaz.com events, you'll see this is like the main page. You'll see the, the copy of the slides are right here because I, I don't use PowerPoint. I use um, other more fun programs like and this was created with Canva. And then we'll also see the Jeopardy directions as well. Okay, and then the FASB codification I see in the chat before I move forward is basically that's our gap. So generally accepted accounting principles is what we as accountants have to follow. And then FASB had standards like statement of financial accounting standards. And then recently they moved to an entire codification. And that was in possibly the ways to try to make us merge with the, the international financial reporting standards. At one point, FASB back in like 2005 wanted to have like a more global set of standards. But then FASB, which is the financial accounting standards board moved to this codification and actually if you go on my website you'll see um, resources and links and then I have the actual site right there for your FASB codification and so um, so that might be helpful to check that out it's free and then we at UMGC we have we have an access code through the American Accounting Association which helps us search so 
Is there, um, so there, just to answer a few more questions before we get started with the fraud, is there a bank that determines the fluctuations of the currency? There isn't really a bank. It is kind of traded though. So they are traded, but it's not necessarily a bank that does that. And I am the most typical victim targeted by everyone. I feel your pain there too. So am I, like, I, I feel like I try to do so much and still my identity gets stolen. And who is the most typical victim of um, cryptocurrency? The, the hackers in cryptocurrency don't discriminate. They're just, I don't think it's more elderly because of the fact that cryptocurrencies are more computer-based and you need to have you know, your seeds and your private keys and your public addresses. So that requires a lot more authentication. But I will say that I don't, you know, it's everybody and anybody can, <laughs> is a victim, as long as they can get access to your information, because then you have no recourse, which is the biggest issue. So thank you for all those great questions. So I went through the chat and then let me see if there's anything else in the Q&A. I don't think so. So I think we got all of that. So excellent. Keep bringing in those cute, adding it in the chat or in the Q&A, any questions you have and I will address them. So this is the nitty gritty now. Now we are on the types of cryptocurrencies fraud. And so here is what I gave you where I kind of pull, I try to give you as many resources as I could so that you know where like to go in case you want to learn more. And then also if you have any questions, you can access this. All of my information is on my website and you'll see my email address, my cell phone number, everything is on here. All of my uh, social media links. So you you can find me. I'm happy to help or answer any questions that I can. And so let's talk about now the types of fraud. So think about this in terms of forensic accounting, where we have a lot of um, different like skimming and we have kiting and we have all types of ways in which we can fraud. Well, now this just gets exacerbated when we're talking about cryptocurrencies. So first we have financial crimes. A lot of the times what we try to do is we take cryptocurrencies are pretty much instant transactions, right? They're portable, they're international. Um, it can be a new tool to avoid taxes, to money launder, to bribe, to embezzle, you name it. So all of the same forensic accounting information that you know, and if you don't, let me just show you really quickly on my website under courses, You'll see I, I teach forensic accounting not only at the graduate level, but at the undergraduate level. So if you click on courses, forensic and internal accounting, I have all of my undergraduates if you need help with what money laundering is or employee fraud or fraud detection or litigation services, check it out. You can just click on any one of these items and it'll show you the lessons that I prepare and any videos that I create. And so just check it out. So if you don't, if you need like, to brush up on what those are, they're there for you. So tax avoidance and money laundering, bribery, and I would say embezzlement are probably the most, and embezzlement is mostly employee fraud. The ACFE, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, uh, basically asset misappropriation is the number one you know, uh, issue more than financial statement fraud. And asset misappropriation is cash, obviously is one of the main things we steal, right? Or people steal. So that is what um, is what's happening here. So let's go to the next one. So here we have scam, which is an ICO, an initial coin offering. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure. So we have an ICO. So the first offering that you're trying to do of any particular cryptocurrency is called an ICO, similar to an IPO, right? An initial public offering. And that can be a means of preying on those that are unsophisticated or don't know the terminology of what's happening. So ICOs could be completely fabricated. They can have like non-existent team members. They can, and typically what you'll see is if you see an ICO, you'll see some maybe fake team members. You might not be able to, you know, unless you do a little bit of digging, find that out. But the the key that kills them is that they take technical work papers copied from other legitimate cryptocurrencies. So, you know, they don't, they copy with pride, but they copy to fraud, which is not good. And so we all know that we can't do that, right? We have to give credit where credit is due, but this is what happens when you're doing an initial coin offering. So let's keep going. And then, so then we have a pump and dump schemes. And I see another question has come in. 
do we have to be in your class to have access to those resources on your webpage? No, not at all. Great question. No, you can just click onto my webpage, drvpaz.com, and you can click anything and everything on my webpage. I share everything since I got into academia. I think I want more accountants and more forensic accountants in the world. I think we need them. So I share everything. You don't have to have anything. You can sign up for a blog. Everything on my website is free. You can sign up to be um, a site member and just you just get emails from me with any time I do a new blog posting, which I did for our, our cryptocurrency here. You'll see that as well. It just takes you, you know, it shows you all that great stuff. So nope, you don't need to be in the class at all. Great question. Perfect. Um, so, and I also have another question. So if it is used for tax avoidance, how come the government did not shut it down? Well, because it's not really illegal. Basically, as a, remember, think about if your tax, taxes between you as an individual with the government and the onus is on you to prove that you did not defraud the government. So that would be, so it's not really coming that you're, like, it's not really that the currency is the problem. It's you as an individual that use the cryptocurrency to avoid your taxes. So you were hiding your assets or you were hiding the revenue so you didn't have to pay taxes on it. So that's why, and so the government can't really, and also the government doesn't regulate it, right? So they don't have any regulation on it and they don't, and it's not backed by financial institutions. But now if they do something illegal, obviously the government can step in, but if for a tax avoidance, it's you as the individual with the, um, with the government. Great questions. Keep them coming. Fantastic. So let's keep going. Let's do, um, pump and dump schemes. <laughs> so a uh, classic pump and dump, right, is where you have an owner of a stocks and they drive up the price right before selling it off um, their holdings of the stock. So they have an artificial, you know, peak. And so you have a gain. And now thinking about taxes, that would be a capital gain, either short term or long term, depending on how long you you've actually held the stock. But now the crypto currency version of a pump and dump is you have claims. So these are all false claims that you kind of hype up the demand and then you permit originators or dominant holders of the currencies to earn these massive phony profits. So instead of you kind of, you so same thing, you'd have false claims, right? So if you're gonna do a pump and dump with stocks, you try to give maybe some good news before earnings or you try to release earnings and they, could, they might have to be restated afterwards uh, as well. So what happens there is here, you're just doing false claims. So there is like no truth to it, but then the people that jet that in this pump and dump that get the most out of it are the actual holders of the currency. So it's kind of more internal as well, similar to shareholders if they have it, but all shareholders would benefit in a classic pump and dump. In our crypto version, it's typically only the owners, the main owners and the dominant owners of the cryptocurrency. So that is where we're at here. So let's do market manipulation. Similar to kind of manipulating your stock price, you can have market manipulations here where you can attempt to manipulate the market where the cryptocurrency is, or there's also derivative products that are traded from cryptocurrencies now. And so FASB has a whole you know, codification on derivatives, which is extensive. And so, but that's like way complicated. But in here, what's happening is we're going to do spoofing, front running, churning, and other schemes. So spoofing, you know, where you're trying to make the market, you're going to give some information or you're going to dump all of your losses in your financials to take a big loss. And we call that a big bath in the, um, in the research and academic world. So if you, if, and then, so that way, the next time you release earnings, you will have like great, you know, go up so much more and, and much higher. And then front running is where you're trying to get ahead of the stock and trying to try to sell it off. And there's a whole bunch of other schemes. All of this is part of forensic accounting, which is what you have to know is that because this is a cryptocurrency and because we have related derivative products, it's so much easier to do in this case. And we have another question in our Q&A. Let me see. The crypto mining aspect is such a mystery to me. How is this new money or these token monies made or earned? And Amber Mine said he had miners doing work for him. From your presentation, that sounds like how it would work. And I'm having trouble understanding that something from nothing aspect. So who is issuing the new token? So those are actually the provide. Like, so there is a cryptocurrency market. So like I have Bitcoins. If you want to buy Bitcoins, you can go ahead and uh, actually my brother buys them for us because he's a securities regulation attorney but there are certain things and then you, it's kind of like a stock i guess because you can make money off of your bitcoins that's how bitcoin became so or as, 
out of your cryptocurrency, I should say. And not, it's not only Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is the most popular and that's the first ones that we owned. And so basically think of it as a stock. So there's like an exchange out there, but it's an exchange. There, could, there also could be an exchange on the market as well. So there are some currencies that trade. Um, and I think Bitcoin is one of them, but basically all you're doing, you're kind of putting in a bid for how much you want. And so then, and then, and then it comes back and then you put it in another bit if it wasn't what you wanted. And then you take that currency and can buy something. A lot of the stuff that you can buy is overseas. I know China uses quite a bit of current of cryptocurrencies. India is now also getting into that as well. At my home school, we have campuses in uh, Palestine and we have campuses in New Delhi and they're very big with, um, and actually the students want to pay <laughs> with cryptocurrency, but my home school doesn't allow that. So it, it's interesting interesting how some of the international markets have taken it. But I would say think of it as like a stock and then there is a market for it, but it's not really, it's like a, just a currency exchange, but it is a, you don't really get any physical dollars, but you do transfer your dollars to purchase it, if that makes any sense. Let's see. What else do we have? So now Ponzi schemes, these are one of my favorites. Um, so crypto um, investments are definitely a vehicle for traditional Ponzi schemes. And so you have new adopters, right? So in order to think about a Ponzi scheme, you need a lot of new people to come in and you need lots of money to be flowing, right? Because you're taking one person's money and giving them some and taking that and giving some profits to other people to keep them happy. And you're just moving funds around. It's similar to channel stuffing, but you're moving all the money but you're pretty much keeping it for yourself. So the fact that you have so many early adopters, that gives you like artificial returns, right? Because you're saying, oh, we're gonna make, we make 30%. But like if, you, if you think about it, Bernie Madoff got caught by an SEC accountant. And because statistically, it was impossible what he was saying that was doing. And you know, so it was just not statistically significant. It, it, it broke every you know model in statistics. And then they caught it because, and that's, that's what usually gets us as forensic and fraud examiners, the ability to kind of catch these things. And we use now a lot of data mining tools as well. And so that is where we want to make sure, you know, so we have a bunch of emerging technologies. And I'll show you a few places on my website where you can read up more about that. But basically what happens is these investments in in these crypto markets are basically the entire like that's the end game that's the end goal for ponzi schemes taking money moving it around and very easily right if you have the keys the private keys the addresses and your wallet seed you're golden that's all you need to make that happen and then since cryptocurrencies as with any new or emerging technology it's you know there's a learning curve difficult to understand so think about it like we just had that question like i can't fathom a currency from nothing right and so since it is so like kind of covert it's very easy to hide monies and it's also since you are the only person that can access it and if you lose it right if you don't have your private keys you can't access the money and you have no recourse so hackers are really always trying to go around that and get you know get your keys so that they can keep your money <laughs> so that's a big issue then we have plain old theft right you know it all goes down to theft that shall not steal right <laughs> so criminals always find new opportunities i say you have to as a forensic accountant you have to think like a criminal in order to solve crimes and i would say in the fraud investigations and the forensic expert witness testimonies that i have participated in it's always about the data. And so the more you know how to data mine and the more you know how to use certain data mining programs, I use IDEA and Tableau quite a bit. And that's what I, I was always, I was using IDEA in industry and then I was using different visualizations, but now Power BI and Tableau, I would say are probably the top two. And I think very, I think Tableau has a bit more robustness due to the ability to have multiple data sources. And I'll show you also on my, let me get to that really quickly so I could show you that. In our course, um, Cyber Forensic Accounting, you'll see that I have here um, emerging technologies and data visualizations. If you click on the data visualization lesson, you'll see I, this was a Microsoft square that I created that links um, all of the Tableau kind of tutorials that I like, you know, and so I added that here for you. So again, it's under the cyber forensic, so courses, cyber forensic accounting and um, data visualizations. It'll tell you, and it's partial because I like Tableau and that's the one I'm familiar with the most. And it also has um, some assignment files as well, just to practice around data sets. And if you also want to practice Kaggle, um, 
dot com, I think it is, is basically, yep. So Kaggle is uh, basically where you can actually find data sets. So I'm always looking for data sets to incorporate into assignments and to bring in real world examples. So Kaggle, Amazon gives um, Kaggle some data sets. I think uh, Walmart had given some information. So this is like another cool way that you can find data sets if you want to just play around and see how things work. So that would be for the data visualization. And then if we still go to the cyber forensic accounting, you'll see emerging technologies here. And, um, and this is where I've tried to compile resources about all of the technologies that like, and I love augmented and virtual reality. I got a grant uh, for $5,000 and I purchased some Oculus headsets and a 360 camera and I'm trying to bring that into the classroom as well. But these are just a bunch of things. You'll see a lot about blockchain and cloud computing and dark data and analytics. This, this kind of dark data is what gets us to the cyber um, forensic accounting and also to the cryptocurrencies. So check it out. It's all there for you. And RPA is a great one. I love RPA. I actually took a workshop uh, from the University of New Zealand on RPA and it was really enlightening. So just that's the two, I would say the main areas. And then I have cybersecurity and again, more assignments that I keep out here. But this is under the cyber forensic accounting course. I would say data visualizations and emerging technologies are some of the really cool ones that we have. So back to our plain old theft, right? So hackers usually want to go for your crypto wallets, which is your wallet seed, and they want to steal your currency because they'll find your wallet seed with your public addresses and with your private keys. Then they might set up fake wallets and they might want to do that with bulk counterparts. So that way they can just do sweeps to see whatever they can find. And of course, they, the biggest one would, similar to the initial coin offering is the phony exchanges. So, and then we have broker dealer fraud. So here the SEC tries to examine these exchanges and funds investing in cybersecurities, but depending on the circumstances, the SEC is now kind of, um, and that's the Securities and Exchange Commission, they are kind of now seeing, is this really a true broker deal or is it an exchange and what rules apply? And also FASB uh, codification, you know, our GAP standards are also kind of, you know, kind of dealing with this as well right now because they just, it, it's all new, right? It's an electronic asset. It's not really tangible. It's intangible, but also it's it's in an, its own exchange, which is like the virtual world with blockchain as security, but no recourse. So there's a lot of, it, it's kind of breaking, it's out of the box, right? It's definitely not our typical asset. So it's, it's giving us accountants a little bit to think about. And then we have unscrupulous promoters. So the SEC has fined, and this is the link. If you click here, it'll take you to the SEC press release here. But basically, they fined Floyd Mayweather and DJ Khalid um, for failing to disclose payments that they received for promoting investments because, and they're promoting investments in those ICOs, those initial coin offerings. So if you click on here, it'll take you to that, and it'll tell, and that just happened re like in, actually two years ago, almost to the date. And you'll see all about that there. So it's really interesting to see how, you know, even, 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 you know, I guess boxers and celebrities are trying to get in the ICO business, but then it, since it, they don't disclose it, then they got in trouble. So, cause of course, SC, you know, the IRS wants your money and the SEC wants you to tell them what they, what you're doing. So that was another interesting way. Okay, so that is what I had for you. The other piece I wanted to show you on my website, so if you like cyber security, if you like forensic accounting and this uh, cyber, cryptocurrency, if you go to courses, I have a data analytics and accounting course. And this I newly created. And on, if you just click on the course tab, you'll see every single course that I have on my website. And here's the forensic. And it gives you a little bit about the course description. And I, I teach accounting information systems quite a bit. And so everything that I have, and it's always a work in process. Like today, I spent a couple of hours setting all of this stuff up for presentations that I've done and such. But if you scroll down, you'll see, and I teach um, at the doctoral level as well. And I'm a dissertation committee member or in chair, so you'll see all that great stuff. But if you come here to data analytics and accounting, 
this is becoming more and more pivotal and you have to do data analytics in order to find fraud, especially in fraud of cryptocurrencies, right? So what I've done here is created a bunch of lessons on data analytics. So for example, if we do financial reporting visualizations, if you click on that lesson, it takes you to a course that I created. And so it gives you a little bit of information on them and it tells you the lessons within the course. And then if you just click start course, it's again, it's free. You can click through it and it just kind of tells you everything that I've done. So this is like my newest versions and I try to embed YouTube videos in there. And then all you have to do is just click on the bottom lesson two and it'll take you directly to that. And it kind of shows you how to do charts. So visualizations for humans are very important because we're not robots, right? We're not computers. So we need to see the data. And I get asked quite a bit, you know, don't you think our job as accountants are going to go away because we because we we're, we're doing RPA and I said no because we can still think and we still have to find the anomalies and we can still see facial expressions and tell you know if or suspect if people are not telling us the entire truth or withholding information and we have to prove that so so that is so I have everything out here and I also have links for you and then I try to do each lesson as you know as much as I can and it, I try to keep it this is a bit more interactive now so uh, I just this is a new program that I just learned this um, summer and so I started working on it so it would make it a bit more you know interesting because I know sometimes I love this stuff but not everybody else does so again that was in data analytics so these first eight lessons are in that same format and then these are just some of the other ones that I taught you, like the emerging technologies and the data visualizations and all that great stuff. So I see another question in our chat, um, uh, in our Q&A. So when someone uses a cryptocurrency washer mixer to hide their tracks, how much does that increase the difficulty uh, to follow the money trail? Oh my God, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yes, so the fact, it, I think cryptocurrencies, what's helping us is the blockchain right because blockchain is that you know permanent general ledger and everything is there and it's an exchange of information and you can't really alter it so there so that's what's keeping i think that piece is what helps us to find it but in terms of the transactions but the money we can't follow you're absolutely right so typically in any type of fraud examination or forensic audit you're you have to follow the money right follow the trail and so in this case the money we can't access unless we have those private keys and the public addresses within our wallet feed and, but we do have the trail in in um, so think of it like the audit trail in blockchain so it's not totally not doable but <laughs> but it can be i think it's gotten worse and i think also the fact that we do have big data and so much volume and velocity and variety of data and now in accounting we are looking at data not only quantitative but we're looking at qualitative data we're scrubbing you know we're using web crawlers to scrub um, anything on social media about an organization to see if it can help us predict if we're gonna have a recall or if we're gonna have quality issues or if our, we're gonna meet revenue expectations. So all of that is a different form of data that as accountants, we've never really looked into, but now we're using that for better decision-making and forecasting and benchmarking. So I, so I think, yeah, it makes it way harder to follow the money, but I do think the fact the permanency and the just cumulative nature of a blockchain helps us tremendously as forensic auditors, but cryptocurrencies, while well, it's a blessing because we have another type of currency and we also have it tied to the algorithms of blockchain and that encryption security, it also can lead to so much more difficulties because as let's say an auditor, we're not following the money per se. And we're relying on that one person that is the owner or the people that are the owners of that cryptocurrency to give us this information because we can't have it, uh, and but we can't see it in action. So that is where it kind of comes a little bit different in that regard. Um, <laughs> so we have another great question. Well, I'm going to stop sharing a minute so that way I can see on my screens all much, so much more, so much more, right? And we have another question. Since the world is moving towards technology and everything, do you think that cryptocurrency can become the new way to operate financially? I do think so. I absolutely think so because I think as with any, it's a different currency. And I, so, and it's, but the currency is more volatile because it isn't backed by anything. And, you know, it's just 
kind of made, it's kind of sold through exchanges and the exchanges are like an IPO, you know, but like the ICO, the initial coin offering is not as regulated. You know, you have to do a prospectus and a red herring and all this great stuff to get to the SEC documents for your IPO. And, you know, you have evaluation and, and then you, you do the IPO. In this case, it's not that until I think that rigor is there or some more standardizations or regulation is there and as much as you know i hate regulation from a like a capital market aspect i do think in accounting we need that but i also think as accountants and the accounting profession we need to start embracing these emerging technologies a lot sooner than we are like auditors now are using drones to kind of you know do inventory site options as bad as COVID is i think it has kind of pushed several industries not only higher education but accounting into more emerging technologies and trying to you know do things in a, in a more electronic fashion we still like the pen and paper and i get that um but i've been paperless as a cfo you know for years now and in my home office i'm pretty paperless as well and more electronic but I, I think these it, it we're going to operate that way, but we also need to have several controls in place to make sure that we have we understand what we're doing and we're also doing it safely and securely. Unfortunately, there's so much cybersecurity and or especially around cryptocurrencies that it's it's getting harder and we always have to like kind of stay a step ahead. And it's really like, you know, that's hard, way harder to do than one would think. Um, Let's see. So we have another question. Um, and can the court subpoena for persons uh, to provide their credentials to assist with investigations? Yes. So I do believe that the courts can subpoena. They can't like say, I need your private key per se, but you can give them access to the information or you can uh, kind of, you you can't really download, let's say, the ledger, but you can show it. And so, because like you can't really download a blockchain per se, but you can show that trail. But as long as, um, and so the courts do have that ability to do that. So that's a good thing, but we have to still figure out, like, it, it's still early on to know how much, like, because you, you can't give a person your private key or your wallet seed, but you can have the public address and you can have, you know, you can have information on your blockchain to, to kind of log your cryptocurrency information. So let's see, we have another great question. So once standard and regulated doesn't just become a normal regular currency, I, it, I don't know, see, cause, I, cause um, I don't know if it could, we could consider it a regular currency because it's not tangible, right? So if you think of currency, you think of bills or coins or anything like that. I guess if you can say it's a virtual token, then you might be able to see it as a currency. But I think the regulation or, you know, just under some type of, maybe not standardization, but also the fact that there are so many different types of cryptocurrencies is probably the biggest challenge because when it was purely Bitcoin or Bitcoin and a few other grand players, I think it was a lot easier. But now with so many more currencies being, you know, kind of developed and a lot, so, so many more ICOs, then, you know, it's, I don't know if that could be the case. <laughs> and so, oh, very informative. Oh, can't wait to see your spring 2021 class. I'm excited. Yes. Oh, I love, I love classes. <laughs> That's what fantastic. How can one Bitcoin be worth more, worth that more than one physical gold coin, because it's it's on the it's on the, you think of it as your typical supply and demand, uh, you know, economic curve. It's it, there is a market there, and so basically you're kind of putting in your bid for that Bitcoin, and then and then you're you're, you're it's like I guess it's like stocks, options, and puts, you know, where you're putting in your options. You're saying I want to buy this stock at this price for and or this range, something similar, but with the fact that it isn't regulated and you can make far more money because it is it's so fluc it can fluctuate like crazy. You know, I mean, way crazier than I think anything else. Let's see, we have some other great questions here. So um, let's see, we have right now, companies don't have to disclose these transactions on financial statements because it is not in the US dollars, correct? Or are they supposed to track them as equivalent amounts in current assets? So that's where, that's that's a perfect question. That's where like Floyd Mayweather and DJ Khalid kind of got in trouble because they earned monies you know, they earned these, these, this income, but they were paid through a cryptocurrency. So they did not disclose it. 
So if you are earning, like say your job pays you with cryptocurrencies, right? But then you still have to report that on your like W-2 form right? that you earn that money. So I think what's, what the problem is, is that you can't track them, right? I mean, unless, unless the person tells you. And then, but when you do, it's also, you have to, whatever that transaction generated for you as a business or as an individual, whether it's income or expenses, then you do have to report that. So yeah, so and that's where the FASB codification is becoming. It's 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 really has to address these these types of issues. Like in you know in the last fifty minutes, we've talked about so many things that are an issue for accountants, and we just have to figure out how we're going to collectively agree to do this. And so because also several other countries are using it, and now we're back to our you know the I, the world is flat, right? Globalization and technology has made anything and everything possible. Look what we're all able to do without even seeing each other, you know, through Zoom. So I think the fact that FASB has to start thinking ahead of the curve, not behind it. And unfortunately, you know, um, FASB is very rules based and um, not, you know, principles based like the, let's say, international standards. Um, so that is where we have to kind of find that happy medium that we can we can do this across this particular currency. So let's see. So if so, if there are so many cryptocurrencies, how do people choose between one and not the other? Uh, so typically, I guess what happens is how wh what are you going to use these um, these cryptocurrencies for? So for example, if you want to buy goods from China and they want it in a Bitcoin, or if you want to buy goods from India, what their currency they want, and then you can trade amongst the currencies. But I would say, and also the the more established currencies are considered safer, right? And it's that, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but like Bitcoin is pretty well known and it's picking up traction. So I think a lot of us gravitate towards Bitcoin and I use cryptocurrency and Bitcoin interchangeably, which I shouldn't. Bitcoin is a type of cryptocurrency, but there's so many others, you know, it's, it's crazy. And if it is a virtual income, how would anyone know about it other than the person who invested paid? That's the thing. Exactly. So what, so like, look, think about the Khalid and, and um, Mayweather. So they received money to be a promoter. So the company that gave it to them probably put it on, you know, their books, let's say as an expense. So now you have something that doesn't match, right? You have somebody saying, Hey, I paid this guy. I have an expense to Floyd Mayweather for $10 million for promoting this event. And, and then you don't see it on Floyd Mayweather's, you know, um, Income, income tax return. So that's the way to find it because it's one party has to come forth with it. But now if you have collusion, as with any, you know, if, as with any fraud, then that's practically impossible. And also the fact that you have blockchain with encryption, even more impossible. So in one aspect, the blockchain is great. It's encrypting it and you, you have some safety there. You can't alter it. Both parties have to kind of put into it. But then with that also is the fact that it could disappear into thin air. And that's where a lot of um, hesitation comes in, right? And that's where a lot of like, okay, and that's where the, you know, regulators such as the SEC and FASB are grappling with because you have to understand it. And then add to that, if you have, so you have blockchain with cryptocurrencies and add that to now that to that robotic process automation, where you're taking like a set of functions and in accounting, this is great for us. I don't know about you guys, but me doing a, a debit and credit entry for cash is pretty mundane, right? So we can teach a computer how to process tens of thousands of transactions based on a set of rules, right? And logical rules. But um, so if you do that and coupling it with the blockchain security and the currency behind it, that can be a deadly combination for the good or for the bad, right? So that could be a very good recipe for fraud or a very good recipe to have, you know, a, a ledger that will never be touched. So excellent, great, keep those questions coming. This is wonderful. Any other, keep them adding. But, and um, I think I put all, so I did, was everybody able to access my website and the presentation files okay and all of that jazz, everything was good there, I hope. And any more questions? This is wonderful, you guys are a lively bunch for a Friday night, I love it. <laughs> Oh, great. All right. Wonderful. So I got confirmation that, yes, you were able to access the presentation. And um, what? thank you. And so it's a great presentation. Yay. I'm so happy. You guys love it. So so you're able to access that. And then you're able, I'll put in the, my, in the chat my webpage. So you have it for future reference. 
And uh, because basically I try to, anything, anything that I do is out there. And so let me see if there's anything else I want to show you. Uh, oh, I do. That's, yes. Let me show you one more thing before we go. And so if you, again, on my website, I, if you go to videos, I have a YouTube channel that I organize for, by class. So I organize playlists by course. And so any videos that I record, I post out here. And so you'll see or any presentations that I do in um, several areas. And then these are some of the videos that I have for auditing. So you'll see it organized by playlist. So feel free to subscribe and make sure you hit notifications because I try to post videos at least once a week, sometimes, you know, depending on the, how the semester goes and, and how my research is going. But you'll see here I have accounting information systems. These are my presentations for forensic accounting, which kind of touch on the money laundering and the skimming and those types of avenues. I, this semester I, I'm teaching governmental, so I'm starting a whole governmental playlist. But you'll see auditing, advanced auditing, financial accounting, corporate finance, intermediate, you name it, anything that I have, I put out here. So you see, I have like um, a, over a thousand subscribers, thousands, almost 300 subscribers. And then you see all of the videos and how I kind of do those and, and I try to make it as interesting, cute as possible. I just, um, and then anything, I also do a lot with Zoom. So I try to put a bunch of videos out there to help my students, but also, uh, you know, like my colleagues. So check it out. But there's a ton of stuff out here that I try to post regularly. And, uh, and so hopefully this will be a help to you. And if you have any questions, and I do reply to all of the comments on my YouTube channels so far, it's been manageable. So as soon as I get it, and typically the comments are, you know, what if the people are looking for an additional chapter of that book or an additional topic, and I do heed those recommendations. So if somebody says, hey, I really need, you know, where's chapter two? I'll go and record a lecture on it just to help. So that is my, and it's, you can access that directly from my webpage under videos. And let's see, is there anything else? I think I showed you the um, resources and links in that. So let me stop sharing again. Sorry about that. And then, oh, very impressive. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent. So any, any more questions I can answer for you? I always try to leave plenty of time because I love the interaction and I think it's brilliant. And I love when we're asking questions, it means we're thinking. And if all of us accountants put our head together, it'll be great. <laughs> any, anything else I can answer for you all? I think I got all of them, or did I miss any questions? <laughs> oh, who is the artist who drew your profile picture? I think it was, so actually my brother, my old, my, my brother, that's a securities regulation attorney. Um, he, I think he went to like mywebface.com. Check that out. I, that rings a bell. And he actually did it, you know, so he had a picture of me and he, and he's not an artist by any stretch. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he was an engineer before he became an, well, he, he you know, he studied math, engineering, and, and then he became, then he got his JD. And he went to mywebface.com and had, like kind of did it. And so it's pretty cool. I know, I love it. And so I'm pretty sure that's it. Let me see. Uh, let's see, my, I think it's mywebface.com. Yep, there it is. So I'm gonna put that in the chat for you all in case I look. I always say she doesn't age. And so that's why I love her because she doesn't <laughs> age. She doesn't get wrinkles. You know, she's always perfect. Her skin is always perfect. So I started using that and that's like kind of like my brand now, I guess. So most of, if you, you'll see a lot of that same caricature on all of on my videos and on my, on some of my presentations. I, yeah, that, that's where I do all that great stuff. Okay, we have another question. Do you think Bitcoin is going to be so popular that it will in X number of years replace the dollar? You know, I, I again, I think it could, I think it has the potential to do that because of the technology around it with the blockchain. But I, uh, the only bad thing, I think, I think the only reason it wouldn't be able to is because not that backing. And the fact that if you lose your private key, you lost that account. And so think about it, how many times do you reset your password, right? <laughs> on, on accounts all the time, or you forgot your password. There's no forget password <laughs> when it comes to your private key. So until, which is 
the good part, because that's the security and the encryption part that, okay, if you don't have that key, you can't get in, too bad, so sad. But the bad part, because there's no replacing it and there's no, so what do you do then? I mean, God forbid, you know, you just completely forgot or, I mean, that's the crazy part. So I don't, I think until that has a, a, a way of being similar to like retrieving your password, then that's where I think um, if that takes place that you can replace that and still have a lot of the security features, then I think we'll be okay. And it could possibly be, I don't know if it would replace it, but possibly be another medium, you know, of currency, but that I think is the inhibitor. And also it's just a relative, anything new is scary. And so, and then with anything new, there's complexities and then the ability to be more fraudulent activities to happen. Perfect. Great, great questions. So who is working on preventing hackers from hacking these intangible assets? If I get Bitcoins, that is basically no guarantee for me that it wouldn't be stolen somehow. You're right. There is no guarantee, but there is several security measures like that private key, like the wallet seed with your public address and uh, with the blockchain to be able to record every transaction and it can't be deleted and it's permanent and it's cumulative. So those are the good features about it. The bad feature is, yeah, if something, if it's gone, it's gone, which is that that's where there's still that kind of anxiety and the risk. So, and forensics opens a new world for accountants. I used to think accountants either do tax or auditing. Now we have many different career paths. Yes, absolutely. I would say forensic accounting and then data analysts and data scientists are now kind of blending in with accounting. Also, I would say a like um, inform information technology. So I think the AICPA has a new certification, I, CISA, I think. Let me look that up really quick. And that's more about, you know, doing more, um, you know, more like, computer audits per se. And so it's, so that is also opening up a bunch of different things for us as well. I think, yeah, I think it's a Cisco um, certification. Let me look for that really quickly. Cause it is, it, it's a pretty new one and, or it might be with the IML. I might have those a little backwards, but the, anything with information technology, I think is, is going to be even more important or anything with data, big data. So if you can take mass amounts of data and put it into a simple, let's say executive summary with visualizations that easily is explained and understood that I think is like a new world for accountants. And that's where our value add can come in. So we as accountants can have our, our value proposition, like, Hey, we're making sense of all of this numbers and all of this data. And we're actually using it to increase sales or to decrease expenses or to increase the bottom line. Do they allow the private keys to be changed? Oh, that's a process. Typically, no. <laughs> I would say typically, no, because uh, once it's assigned, that private key is assigned to that account, right? And so to your public address. And you, you, But you can have several different addresses and private keys, so you don't have to. It's not the same one, per se. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, we are almost at the hour. Thank you so much for all of those fabulous questions. Keep them coming because I will still stay on and I'm going to help Sherry um, kind of get into that. I did see another question about going um, to advance the taxing of crypto. It seems like that would be on the honor system. That's another area I didn't even think about mentioning. You're absolutely right. It's nine um, o'clock. Taxing it is is going to be another issue, right? Because unless they, you tell them, like we have with the you know DJ Khalid and Mayweather issue, then that yeah that's another you know consideration it's it's, it's on the honor system and then but if you get busted not good <laughs> excellent well thank you all for joining it has been my pleasure and you guys have been fabulous i mean thanks so much for all these great questions and everything sherry it's all yours thank you veronica that was really exciting I think I feel like I need to read up to thoroughly understand everything that you discussed with us today. So I look yeah. forward to going to yes. your website and learning more. Thank you so much. No so problem. Now um, I'm going to actually stop the video and create another.